A number of years ago, and I may have mentioned this, uh, my wife and I and our kids went on holidays, and uh, we we're going through the New Hampshire White Mountains, and, and there's a mountain there called Mount Washington, and you can drive up to the very top. You're above the clouds. It's cold. It's windy. And of all the things that we did, we went up, up the hill, and you listen to a CD on the way up and tells you all what's going on around you and stuff. And uh, we went up the hill, and, and it was exciting. And I, I know I mentioned this before. I'm going to mention it again. I made a mistake and asked one of the people up top. I said, do cars ever go over the edge? And she goes, yes. And if you would go up the mountain and look over, you can't see the bottom. It's cliffs. It's not hills. It's cliffs. And I said, how do they get them out? And I said, they don't get the cars out. That's how bad it is. Something happened on the way down that just the trip was not as exciting because there's no guardrails. On the way up, I was, I was scared. My, my hands were shaking. On the way down, I'm surprised it wasn't as bad. But on the way down, there's no guardrails. Your brakes can fail. There's places you've got to stop because your brakes are heating up and all that. So, Pastor, why are you saying that? This morning, we're going to be talking about something that it's a side trip, but I'm sorry it's not going to be exciting. I'll leave it at that. You're not going to run the aisles. I, I need you to hear me out. It's what the Lord laid on my heart. It's not because of anything. And the guys, if you went to Tim Horton's, the other night and had the frozen fellowship like we did. You're going to know a little bit because I, and it just seemed like the talk has been coming up this week. No, nothing specific, but, but in our quest, everybody say my quest. We're going to jump into the uh, fifth session of our side trip called prayer. And I'm not sure that even as seasoned saints, we understand the importance of prayer. We understand it, but we don't. Prayer, how important it is. Praying continually, how important it is. But praying effectively, the way Jesus taught us to pray, is nothing short of powerful. And what a nugget of truth this side trip means to you and I, the child. It should. It really should, because this is our communication with God. This is our not reading, but hearing and communicating with our Creator. But when we can read his teachings, and when his disciples say, teach me to pray. Right. How often have we said that in our mind, Lord, I don't know how to pray. I've been serving God 40-something years, and if I miss prayer for a week, or, or like the weekly prayer or whatever, or I miss a couple of days of prayer, the first thing I'm going to be transparent here, the first thing in my mind is, Lord, I don't know how to pray. Am I, am I by myself here? I don't think I'm by myself. Many times people needlessly struggle with prayer when the answer lies before their very eyes. The words of Jesus, it takes the guesswork uh, out of our prayer. And, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be honest, uh, Richard, where you're sitting, that's where I pray on Monday nights. I go into that little corner, not, not for any purpose other than it's a little corner. But I opened my Bible up, and I got the Lord's Prayer. Again, serving God 40 years, I can memorize, I can verbatim tell you what it is, but I've got it open because I want to read it. Because I want to be reminded what I'm doing. So the words of Jesus takes the guesswork out, takes the feelings out. It takes the mystique out of prayer. It exposes the desires of the kingdom to the people of the kingdom. And as we look, Jesus began with preparation, our mindset shutting ourself off from everything else is unassociated, focusing our attention, knowing and acknowledging who it is that we're actually talking to. Amen. Opening up ourselves, inviting the kingdom to come in and the will of God to come in. And to do that, we've got to make room, so we've got to get rid of our kingdom and our will. There's no room for both. Asking for our daily bread, not for to take care of our wants and needs and wishes and desires, but asking the Lord what he wants me to have today. 
and forget about what we want or think we need, but what, Lord, what do you want me to receive? What we need may not be the same as somebody else because we're at different levels of revelation. God's not going to show you something you can't handle. He's going to show me stuff, amen, that, that he won't show somebody else because I need it for whatever purpose, good or bad. If you need greater revelation, he's going to give it to you. If you need greater understanding, it's yours. Amen. If you need greater conviction, let me say conviction. We don't pray for conviction, do we? We pray for revelation, power, anointing, but we don't pray for conviction. It's up to you and I, every say me, to prove what is that good acceptable and perfect will of God for my life. So this is how I do it. And the most important part of prayer is to leave ourselves open for what he wants to share with us and give to us. He may put a scripture in your mind. He may put a remembrance in your spirit. He may speak something new. He might speak something old. Whatever he, get, whatever he gives you, he's going to back it up in his word. He will never go against his word. And if we've emptied ourselves of our kingdom and our will, then we need to let him fill those voids in our life with what he knows we have need of. You may not understand, and God's spoken to me and given me things I didn't understand. I go, why? What is this? And then later on, it could be weeks later, revelation comes and said, that's why. Anybody ever have that happen? Maybe not weeks, could be hours or minutes or whatever. You're reading your Bible and say, wow, where would that come from? And yeah, I was just talking about that a few minutes ago. Amen. We, we may not understand everything, but eventually we will. The manna we received yesterday. Everybody say the manna. Remember, God will not give you something you don't need. But the manna he gave you yesterday may not be valid for today. The word is valid. Don't get me wrong. But you need fresh anointing every single day, fresh revelation every single day, fresh food, fresh anointing, Fresh blessing. Is it so hard to imagine we need to pray every day? Let's move on. After all that, the, 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 the preparation of the physical, preparation of the mental, the preparation of the spiritual. And now Jesus continues in this side trip we call prayer. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, forgive and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is one is going to be a little bit more hard, a little bit more difficult to accept because now the onus becomes on us. The first portion is asking for forgiveness. The problem is it's hinged on the second portion of forgiving others. The word debt and debtors comes from the word that means morally at fault. So most of us are aware that what Jesus was saying is it's time to ask for forgiveness of our moral failures or sin as we forgive those who have morally failed or sinned against us. To me, to me, let me say to pastor, if I were to teach on prayer my way, I would suggest we do this at the beginning of prayer. That we repent, and that's what it is, at the beginning of prayer. And I often wonder why this is later in prayer. I'm glad to tell you that it's not my teaching that counts. And it's not my thoughts that count. It's not my ways that count. It's a desire of the Holy Ghost. Here's my perception, a couple things. If prayer was designed to repent first. Now, we, in our walk with God, we've got to repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Ghost. We understand that. I'm not taking away from that because that is the order of our salvation. That's the plan. But in prayer, Jesus didn't put it at the beginning. He put it near the end. And, and this is, I believe this is why. If prayer was designed to repent first, it would seem like a bribe to God. How often have you come into church, you're not going to agree with this, you're not going to uh, uh, speak out about this, but way back in the recesses of your spirit, you're repenting so God can touch you here. 
Anybody? I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But that's what we do. Lord, forgive me for I sinned yesterday so I can get the anointing today. I don't want to bribe God, and he doesn't want you to bribe him either. Now remember last week, give us this day our daily bread. Revelation, understanding, concepts, principle. That opening, when we talk to God and say, Lord, open my spirit up or give me what I need, then the Lord is able to move on your life to show you the sin that's in your life that you need to repent of. You see, many times it's at this place where the Lord can show us things that we have forgotten about. I remember preaching at a church, and it was a neighboring church, and, and, and the Lord gave me something, and I didn't want to preach it, but I preached it. I told them, I said, you know, you think that because it's years ago that you did this, that God has forgotten about it because you're having good service. But God doesn't forget your sin. And even though you're having miracle signs, wonders, and, and, and running the aisles, that does not mean you're forgiven. See, we forget because we, we put things away we don't want to remember, or time has a way of hiding things. And so when we're praying, we're opening ourselves up. And here it is. The more we're praying, the more we're talking to God, the more we're opening ourselves up, the more we're asking God to show me what I need to have. Lord, reveal to me, give to me the things I need, the more he can go deeper and deeper in my spirit and my mind and pull stuff up to my remembrance that I can take care of it. So now I don't have to wait until the next session of prayer. How many remember yesterday morning? <laughs> the exact things that you thought of yesterday. See, the Lord can show you something today. And if you don't deal with it right now, you're going to forget it tomorrow. And it's going to go the whole process again. You're, you're going to go through the prayer, prayer, and God's going to show you. I showed you yesterday, but here it is today. Oops, I'll do it tomorrow. So right when God shows you things, you can deal with it, good and bad. You can rejoice when God gives you something to rejoice, or you can repent when God gives you something mindful of repentance. Now let's go back to the hinge concept regarding forgiveness. Our receiving uh, forgiveness is directly associated with our ability to, and our willingness to forgive others who have failed us. There's no mention of whether their failure was accidental, whether their fa failure was coincidental, or their, fa uh, their, their failure was consensual. What that means is there's no mention if somebody sinned against you by accident, not even knowing. And there's no mention of somebody, you know, uh, just because of side issues, they offended you. And there's no issue if they did it on purpose, because people offend you on purpose. I don't know if you knew that, but. <laughs> but there's no mention of the type of failure it was that somebody did against you. Join me today. Because you're part of everybody. You're in this pool called everybody. Everybody wants forgiveness. Everybody is quick to receive forgiveness. Meanwhile, the difficult part is forgiving somebody else. Remember I said it's going to get a little rough? Here we go. Often we hear, maybe not with our ears, but we sense, and we're like this, maybe. We hear, do you know what so-and-so did to me? Anybody ever hear that? I don't like them but I have to love them because we're in the church. I can go to the same church, but I don't want to fellowship with them 
or with so-and-so because whatever, so I'm going to stay home. I'm going to stay on the other side of the room. I'm going to go out to the parking lot. Anybody ever? No, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> All those things, you know what they are? They're flashing neon lights saying unforgiveness. See, we're really quick to say, Lord, forgive me, or come to you when I've offended you, saying, Dave, forgive me. But all that forgiveness is hinged on the fact of, am I willing to forgive Tanya for offending me? Bitter feelings. Anybody ever hear bitter feelings? Hanging on to hurts, hanging on to offenses, hanging on to mistakes, hanging on to errors. Oh, we don't, we're not going to like this one. Hanging on to the past. I just thought of a, image I could put on the screen. I wish I would have thought of it earlier. Doing this is only spiritually hanging ourself. It's only hanging ourself because Jesus said to receive forgiveness, you first have to forgive. It's easy to forgive our friends. My best friend hurt me with a knife, a dull knife in the back. He stabbed me. And it, I grumbled and I complained for a few weeks. But I don't know, I'll say 30 years, 25 years later, he's still my best friend. Not because he's my friend. I forgave him because I had to. He was my friend, but he lost that friendship for a short time. <laughs> But now we're even better friends. And I don't even think I told him how he offended me. I, I, I may have. I don't remember. If you only forgive your friends, you will not receive forgiveness regarding others. If you put stipulation on your forgiveness, you know what a stipulation is? I'll forgive them one more time. You know what's going to happen? You're going to receive the same stipulation back one more time. It doesn't matter how powerful. And here it is. We go to the Lord, and, and let's just stop, pause that for a moment. We go to the Lord and say, Lord, I am so sorry I sinned, and I apologize, Lord. I'm going to make my life better. And, and without the first half, and you know how we feel? We come out of it feeling better, don't we? We feel light. We feel joyful. But that's your emotion doing that. Because you want to feel better. You think you've done a good job. That's not the Holy Ghost making you feel better. That's you making yourself. Well, Pastor, how do you know that? Because the Scripture says if I don't forgive those other people, then I cannot receive. doesn't matter how good I feel. Doesn't matter how lighthearted I feel. Doesn't matter how joyful or powerful I feel in the Holy Ghost. I know churches, amen, that, that, uh, that they preach false doctrine and, and they're having people jumping and dancing in the Holy Ghost. They receive healing and miracles in their churches. They don't preach proper doctrine. So you can't link what the Word says and what we experience together. We got to take the word at the word's sake and apply it to our lives. I don't care how good I feel when I get up from repenting. If I don't forgive my brother or my sister, I don't care. It doesn't matter how good I feel. It's wrong. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter how I think after I repented. I'm sorry, I, I just got to 
come inward a little bit, talk about myself. And if it applies to you, please apply it. But I think I do a good job <laughs> when I do that. Because I don't want to think evil of myself. All we're doing is fooling ourselves with self, everybody say self-imposing. Self-imposing emotions. Watch this. First John chapter 4, verse 20. If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, if I say I love God and I hate my brother, it makes me a liar. For he that does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Now John justifies his statement very powerfully. He said, I'm not talking off the wind or, or, or the sun rays that are making me feel good. He said, this commandment we have from him. He who loved God loves his brother also. Now, here, here's a little thing here. When we say the word hate, it's very aggressive. I hate this and I hate that. I hate coconut. I hate dates. I, I hate cream cheese. I hate cottage cheese. Very aggressive, but I'm going to stick to it. But when it comes to people, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to situations, the word hate does not just mean that aggressive hate. It also means to love less. Let's go back. If a man say, I love God, and he loves less his brother, Tanya, I don't hate you. I just don't like you. You know I'm just teasing. <laughs> If I say I love God and tell Tanya with, not in words, because I'm not going to say those words, but in my action, my lifestyle, I don't like her. I hate her le or like her less. That makes me a liar. And liars are going to have their part where? In the lake of fire. But I feel good when I get around Tim because I like Tim. So God sees me with Tim, shaking hands, drinking coffee, listening to Tim. <laughs> Whew. See, in our case, if somebody offends us, unless it's really bad, we don't hate them. We, we don't hate them, but neither is there love for them anymore. Have you ever heard the phrase or experienced they're wearing on my nerves. <laughs> See, according to John, there is no difference between hate and loving less. They're liars. And so there's, you know, like we say there's, there's white lies and dark lies. There's no such thing. A lie is a lie is a lie. And there's no such thing in the kingdom of God about hating or loving less. There's no difference because it both makes us a liar. And regarding the church and the body of Christ and us, this is so important because Apostle John recorded Jesus in, in uh, John chapter 13, 34. He said, a new, everybody say a new commandment. We know the old commandments, thou shalt not kill, steal, and all that. Here's a new one, folks. I'm going to give you a new one. He said, they that love one another as I, I loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. Let me say it again. Jesus said, I've got a commandment for the church. It's a new commandment. It's not the law of the whole world is to abide by. This is for the church. This is for you. This is for me. This is for the body of Christ. Amen. That you love one another as I have loved you. 
as they pulled the beard of Jesus out, as they speared him on the, on the cross, as they made fun of him, amen, as, as they uh, uh, cast uh, uh, dies for the clothes, whether they argued, whether they walked away from him, he still loved those same people. That's how the church is to love one another because that shows, amen, the presence of God in the church. It proves that this is how the world is going to know you're my disciple. This is good. It's not how you preach. It's not how you scream. It's not about running the aisles. It's not about clapping your hands. It's not about all that stuff. I'm going to tell you, it's the love you have one towards another. That's why when people walk into church, you may not notice it anymore because we're accustomed to it. But when people come through the doors of the church, they feel the love. It's a testimony of the church. They walk in, they don't talk to anybody, but they feel something. Uh, they see the fellowship together, the shaking hands, uh, the talking one to another. They, they see that, uh, and there's something about it uh, that draws them because it's drawing them to Christ. Sad to say, I don't want to talk to anybody, they feel that too. How did Jesus, for, forgive me, but forget the cross. Just forget the cross for a moment. Let's bring this up to date into 2024. How does Jesus love us? Personalize it. Knowing we sinned against him, and yet he forgave us. Knowing, ever say knowing, we still sin against him, and he still loves us. That's why the scripture says that if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. You're back to lying again. Talking to the church. So if you didn't sin today, fasten your seatbelt because you're going to sin later on sometime today. You're not going to want to. You're not going to think you do. You're going to tell people, I haven't sinned. I'm not going to sin today. And you might not. You might be the epitome of angelic beings in bodily form. But you're not perfect. Even the angels fell. Two -third, or a third of them fell. Knowing we sin against him, he still forgives us. This, let me say this. I'm sorry for getting to repeat, but I need this is so important to the church. This is how the church ought to be. Tanya offended me, but I'm going to be very quick to forgive her and treat her like my sister that she is. Poor Tanya today. <laughs> but all Dave's all bruised up and <laughs> Tim's all bragged up. <laughs> Let's go back to last week, just for a moment. We see how the Lord operates. In prayer, we sincerely prepare ourselves, amen, and enter His presence. In prayer, we empty ourselves out of our kingdom and our will and let His kingdom come in. We open ourselves up. We ask Him for revelation, understanding to come to our lives. He speaks to us. He reveals what we need to take care of. In reading our Bibles, amen, He opens things up and reveals things to us. In preaching, when we're, when we hear the word of God, we, and I preach to myself, don't worry, I go home sometimes and say, wow, did I actually feel that one? Otis, you know what I'm talking about. That it's not just pushing out, it's pushing in. And if you want to feel condemnation, you stand behind a pulpit and preach something that's condemning you. He opens the door for us to deal with our failures. I don't know if you knew this, the Lord's not going to go to the internet, Twitter, or Facebook and reveal to the world your sin. He's not going to do it. He will not share your failures with a church family or friends. He'll speak to you. He'll show you. 
He will open the door. He may speak to somebody to privately come to you and say, the Lord says, you have this in your heart. I know nothing about it, but the Lord's told me to tell you. But it's not going to come from the pulpit. It's going to come very, very privately. Where am I going with this? Let me share something with you. That's not how we operate. I'll tell you why. Tanya said something. So instead of going to Tanya, I go to Otis. I say, Otis, you know what Tanya did? Is anybody <laughs> anybody ever done that? Come on. We've all done it. Okay. <laughs> Me, myself. Okay, fine. I'll just stop. All the Lord is asking is for us to do the same thing with those who sinned against us. We covered up with counsel. I need to counsel. I need, I need advice. I need you to tell me how to do this because I'm dealing with this. I, I, I got to cover up because I don't know what to do. I don't know how to talk to Otis because he's unapproachable. I don't know how to deal with the situation because dot, dot, dot. Scripture is telling us this, though. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. But Otis is unapproachable. Walk up to him. You can walk up and shake his hand and say, praise the Lord. He's approachable. Tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Notice it says alone. Doesn't say with a group of people. It doesn't say with 150, uh, you know, family, friends, and neighbors on Facebook. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained your brother. The problem is we don't do that. We don't do that. But let me go back to the hinge factor. Remember the hinge? If I want forgiveness, I've got to forgive. If I don't want it going on the internet, I better not put stuff on the internet. I told you it's not going to be an easy task this morning, didn't I? But that's the way it is. See, we're living again in a society that we don't do this. It affects the church. It affects the body. It hinders the spirit of God. And I'm sorry, I do not want to hinder the Spirit of God. I want liberty. Jesus, one of the most basic and fundamental things we can do is pray. And not just pray, not just pray abundantly, but pray effectively. And what? how do we pray effectively? We follow the course that Jesus gave us. And part of the course is, if I want forgiveness, I better be quick. To forgive those who offend me. See, if I go to, if I, uh, um, Tanya says something and offends me, and, and I go to Otis, uh, Tanya might not even know she offended me. She might have been speaking Ukrainian, thinking Ukrainian, talking in English, and it came out wrong, and I took it the way I thought to take it. She didn't do it on purpose. It's just one of those, um, what, what I call it, uh, um, those, those errors uh, that, that uh, not unintentional side effect of her speech. So I go to Otis, uh, and then it goes, bam! So I might as well tell the world. Not that Otis is going to tell anybody. But I go to Tanya and say, Tanya, you offended me. Well, how, how say, it, say how, Pastor. Nice and loud. No, how? Uh, Louder, nice and loud. How, Pastor? How, Pastor, did I offend you? Well, you said, that, well, I, no, I didn't mean that. And it's all straight. You know what happens? I gained my sister. 
I gain my, this relationship grows. You know what happens when you cut yourself? Your body heals and that spot where it was cut and healed is stronger than anything around it. Any skin around that, that scar uh, is not as strong as the scar itself. So when, when I think she, she offended me and we straighten it out, uh, we become stronger than anything else ever before. Or maybe she meant to offend me. Praise God. And she goes, how, pastor? I said, well, you know, you shouldn't say this. That her, Oh, I didn't know. Or, or oh, I'm, I'm sorry I did that. I shouldn't have done that. It's intentional, but she's apologizing. So what happens? Again, made stronger. When somebody trespasses or sins against us, we need to go to them privately, open the door to restoration. We need to make way for that brotherly or sisterly love to take hold. If they refuse to hear, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I said, you know, a lot of stuff we do is for ourselves. See, I, I've done my job. When, 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 I, when I pray, I've done my job. When I, when I invite people to church, I've done my job. If I, if I teach home Bible studies, I've done my job. The rest is up to the people. I can't control whether she wants to forgive me or not. Or she, she can't control whether I forgive her or not. But my job, hey man, as the one who, who's, who's been offended, my job is to go back to them. I've done my job. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And if they won't receive what I've said, bring a witness. And so I bring a witness to Tanya. Dave comes along with me. No, no, no you're, you're bruised. Uh, Tim, you, you come with me, and, and you're, you're healthy, and, and you're wise. So I bring you. Hey, Tanya, this happened, blah, blah, blah. And then it's restored. Nobody knows about it, just Tim and I and her. And that's it. It's shut, door shut. There's no sense of me going on Twitter or Facebook and saying, hey, Tanya, if anybody, it's okay now. That's just plain dumb. But if she still won't hear, the Bible says we mock them because they're causing disunity. What does disunity do in the church? It tears the church apart. I'm sorry, I love you, but we cannot take disunity in the church. No, there's no room. Oh, you might be the greatest tithe payer. You, you might be the greatest lawnmower expert. You might be the cleaner of the church, but if you're causing disunity, you're doing more damage than you can think of doing anything good. See, it's no longer about me anymore. It's not about my pride. Amen. It's about the kingdom of God. Me being offended, take care of it. Me being hurt, take care of it. The church being hurt, take care of it. Amen. So it does not affect the body. But if I go to Tim and say, Tanya offended me, then I go to somebody else, Tanya offended me, I now am the one doing the damage. Not her. So you tell me, who's worse than who? Speaking of the church, and I'm not talking about us in here, but I'm talking about church in general. Jesus did not sacrifice his life so that you would not be offended. Can I say it again? Jesus did not die to protect you from being offended. In fact, Luke chapter 17, verse 1, he said to the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe to him through whom they come. So it's an impossible task. We, we want, and I'm sorry, we want the church to be perfect. You know, I want my car to be perfectly running all the time. I bought a new car, and within months, back to the shop it goes. There's no guarantee you're not going to be offended. It's how we affect or how we handle the offenses that count. 
in the same conversation that he mentioned that if your brother trespass, letting us know he was not specifically speaking of the outsider. Because go back to the prayer. If you're ever say your brother, who's that talking about? It's not talking about my neighbor outside. It's not talking about the clerk in the store. He's saying, if your brother, and we can put in brackets, sister, so you're not off the hook, sister. <laughs> and I'm just going to add, and I apologize for adding, but if your brother or sister trespass, <laughs> that tells me it's coming inside. It's telling me, don't worry, we expect outside, don't we? And that's a problem. We expect the outside, but we don't expect the inside. I thought Otis knew better than that. Well, you know what? He didn't. Oh, no, sorry, Otis. I expected Tanya to be better than that. But guess what? I expected too much, maybe. Maybe Tanya's having a bad day. Maybe, maybe Tanya just got battleground at home for two weeks with Michael. And she's not thinking square or whatever the reason. It doesn't matter. We expect the outside, but we don't expect it to come from the inside. But Jesus was not talking about the outside. He was talking about the inside. He has called us to be in the kingdom. He has called us to be the body. He has called us to be ambassadors. He said the world would know you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. He didn't say love the world. He said one for another. You show your love because we want the world to see you love Jesus. And you show them the best you can be. And you should because you're ambassadors. But you're no less an ambassador in the house of God. That's more responsibility with your brother or sister to treat them properly. And you better repent, sister. He said, the world would know you're my disciples by the love you have in the church, in the body, in Christ. Again, if I tell everybody that you hurt me, especially without me coming to you, I'm causing disunity. I'm now trespassing or I'm morally failing the kingdom of God. I've taken your sin and put it on my life. And now I am in that same sin. So you tell me something, which is worse? Which is worse, you failing me or me failing God? We've got to be so careful. Jesus said to line up our repentance with our willingness to forgive others. Matthew 7, 1, he said, judge not that you not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in your brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in your own eye? Or how wilt thou say to your brother, let me pull out the mote out of your eye, and behold, the beam is in your own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Oh, it's easy to see a sliver of imperfection in somebody else's life. And we hold it against them forever and ever. Amen. But what we don't see not the same sliver, but we see a beam in our own eye. We don't see it. We don't see it because of self-protection again. We don't see our shortcomings, our failures. It's always somebody else's fault. You know, Tanya made me say this. Tanya made me do that. She, no, no, no. I did it because I wanted to because I've got a choice. Mark eleven twenty five. When you stand praying, here we go back to prayer. What's he say to do? Forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive 
your trespasses. I'm going to go back to the beginning. doesn't matter how you feel. I feel Jesus in this place. I feel peace beyond measure. I feel joy unspeakable. I don't care. The word is the word is the word. And if we won't forgive, we're not going to receive forgiveness. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul was writing about being changed. He said, put off the old corrupt lifestyle. He said, be renewed in the spirit of the mind. You change your mindset. Put on the new man. Don't let the old man drive you. Put away lying, speaking truth with your neighbor. It's okay to be angry, but don't sin in that anger. Don't give room to the devil. Don't steal. And all these things he mentioned. Then he gets here in verse 29. He said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Watch. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So he was telling us not to speak corrupt things, just good things. Don't grieve or cause a spirit to even heaviness. Stop your bitterness, your wrath, your anger, the crying, the evil speaking. Put away wickedness. Be kind one to another. Be compassionate one to another. Be forgiving one to another. Again, key words, even as God has, has forgiven you. In Bible college, Brother B.J. Church, he was the pastor of the church, and he was president of Bible college. One of his favorite phrases was this, folks, this is where the rubber meets the road. You know what that means. This is where real stuff takes place. If you cannot talk to somebody because you don't like them, or because somebody's done something wrong to you. They are not the problem. You are the problem. In 1 John chapter, before we go to 1 John, because I am the problem, it's not up to you to fix the problem. If I am the problem, then it's up to me to fix the problem. So if I can't talk to Tanya for whatever reason, she's not the problem. I'm the problem. So you know what we do? I'm going to wait until Tanya comes to me and, and, and ask for forgiveness. Don't we? we? We do that. You know, she didn't, she didn't say she was sorry. She doesn't even know she did anything wrong. She doesn't know I'm hurt or offended or tormented or troubled. She doesn't know that. Until somebody else phones her, hey, you know what pastor said? <laughs> oh, I look on the internet. Oh, on Facebook. <laughs> Love Facebook. Mm -hmm. Not. But I become the problem, and because I become the problem, I'm given provision how to fix my problem. So it's up to me to fix my problem. In 1 John chapter 1, John writes this, if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie. Man, we lie again and we have no truth. If we walk in the light as he is light, we have fellowship. If we walk in the light as he is a light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of, from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. 
One last point here. The, some scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus with a woman caught in the act of adultery. Now, going back to first on this scripture, notice all the, uh, I don't even know the terminology, the conjunction word, if. All the ifs are there. So that tells me it can go one way or the other. If I say I have fellowship with him and, and, and walk in darkness, we, I, I'm lying and I'm not in truth. If I walk in the light as he's light, I have fellowship with one another. But it's, it's hinged on that word if. If I'm spiritually, I better be ready to walk with you, brothers and sisters. If I'm walking in the light, I better be able to join hands and arms in prayer and, and love one with another. Only if. If my people who are called by my name, if they, if they are called by my name, if I'm your people, then I'm called to prayer. If not, forget it. If you do this, I'll do this. If you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. But if you don't, I won't. So all these ifs that John was writing about and all these things are so important to prayer. If I pray the way he wants me to pray. Scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus. A woman caught in adultery. That's pretty bad. It's not rumored. It's not speculation. She's caught in the act. And they yanked her out, took him to Jesus. They're trying to trip him up. The official punishment is for her to be stoned. And so they're trying to get to him and try to trip him and catch him in his own words. In John chapter 8, verse 6, they said to him, tempting him, and they said they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he did not hear them. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin, cast the first stone. So the next time somebody offends you and you want to bite their head off, or if you want to put it in the newspaper, there's no newspapers anymore, is there? It's all electronic. Or you want to put it in a book and sell it on, on Amazon? Think about that. Am I without sin? Am I able to cast a stone at them? No. Verse 9. They that heard it, they were convicted in their own conscience. They were scribes and Pharisees. They were the elite. They weren't the peons of life. They weren't the carpetbaggers. These are learned men, scribes, Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee. They, they were learned, they were educated. They were, they were, they were, they were the big shots in, church, in, in the world, in the church of Israel. And Jesus just said, hey, he that is without sin, let them cast the first stone. They're convicted in their conscience. They went out one by one, beginning at the eldest to the last. See, he was the wisest. He's the smartest. He's the oldest. They went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus lifted him up himself, and he saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Isn't that awesome? You see, she, she went against the word of God. And they accused her, and they brought her to Jesus, and God manifests in the flesh. So said, I'm not accusing you. Go. Go and sin no more, but go. How often we see somebody fail. I, 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 I got to stop Tanya. S stop picking on her. We see somebody fail. 
And in our minds, we say, I would never do that. How, how can they do that? I would never do that. How could they? They should know better. Anybody's shields going up now? We may not be involved in that, in what somebody else has fallen into, but let me be a judge for a moment. You have fallen, every one of us has fallen into something that in the eyes of God is wrong. Your beam is just as bad as their beam in their eye. You may not have fallen into what they... You're not going to fall into something you're strong in. But maybe they've never fallen into what you're hiding. Brother, would you come up here? That old adage, the old saying, when you point your finger at somebody, you have three fingers pointing back at yourself. So important in prayer, so important in my walk with God, that I, that I examine myself, Lord, is there any bitterness? Is there any hatred? Is there any malice? Is there any dislike? Do I not like people in the church? Do I not, is there anybody that I, I can put my, my mind on that, that just I hate? Let's stand. Lord, forgive me. Scripture says that if you have ought against your brother, you're to leave your gift at the altar. Go back to your brother, make things right. And can I be so bold and say God's not going to talk to you until you straighten it out? That's how important it is that we love one another. Is there a possibility that we find a place to pray? Because I'm not preaching to you. I'm not teaching you. I'm teaching me. I'm preaching to me. And God is dealing with me right now. And so I've got to lay myself down and I've got to talk to God and I've got to forgive Tanya. I've got to forgive Tim. I've got to forgive Otis. I got, there's not, I don't have, I'm just saying, there's people I've got to forgive who have hurt me. And in my mind, I've got ought against them. Ah, rough and scruff and dirty, good for nothing. And clear that out. So Lord can move on my heart. And Lord, if there's somebody, and I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, Lord, years ago I was praying about something totally off, and Lord showed me something that I did years before and said, go to that pastor, ask for forgiveness. I said, Lord, he doesn't even know what I did. Go. Lord, I forgot all about it. Go. And I had to phone him up and say, forgive me. You, don't, you know nothing about what I'm talking about, but just forgive me. God spoke to me. Let's pray.